The world watched in horror as U.S. Border Patrol agents opened fire with tear gas on a group of refugees seeking asylum in the United States. These agents fired rounds across the border into Mexico. Donald Trump claims that many of these refugees are hardened criminals. I didn't say in all cases, but in many cases, these are hardened criminals. These are tough, tough people. But as with many things that come out of Trump's mouth, he offered no facts to back it up. He just uses the most powerful podium in the world, that of the American president, to slander masses of suffering people looking for refuge. Among the targets of this assault by U.S. forces were women and children, many of whom had fled Honduras. Across the news media, these refugees are simply referred to as migrants or the caravan. Rarely do we get any context of why they are risking their lives and the lives of their children to flee Honduras. And part of why you don't hear this context is because to really tell this story, you need to talk about the U.S. dirty wars in Central America in the 1980s, the impact of neoliberal economic policies, the catastrophe of climate change caused by the U.S. and other major world powers. You need to know history. I was a racketeer, a gangster for capitalism. I helped make Mexico safe for American oil interests. I helped in raping of half a dozen Central American republics for the benefit of Wall Street. I helped purify Nicaragua for the international banking house of Brown Brothers. I brought light to the Dominican Republic for the American sugar interest. I helped make Honduras right for the American fruit companies. And if you know this history, particularly in Honduras, then you know that what we are seeing now is a situation where the U.S. set a house on fire, and as the flames have raged, the U.S. is standing against the people trying to flee the fire that Washington set to their homes. My fellow Americans, I must speak to you tonight about a mounting danger in Central America that threatens the security of the United States. Throughout the 1980s, the Reagan administration waged a series of dirty wars throughout Central America. And after the leftist Sandinistas took power in Nicaragua, the U.S. began a program to support a death squad known as the Contras. Neighboring Honduras, which was technically a newly democratic state, was in reality ruled by a right-wing military junta. The forces under General Gustavo Alvarez operated a notorious CIA-backed death squad in Honduras known as Battalion 316. Thousands of people were killed during this period in the name of fighting communism. You can't have communists running free all over the place doing what they want to do. What happens if the United States get attacked by communists or we leave it open to be attacked by communists? What happens then? Honduras was the staging ground for U.S. support for the Contras, and the point man for the Reagan administration was Ambassador John Negroponte. Now, Negroponte cut his teeth working for Henry Kissinger during the Vietnam War. As ambassador to Honduras from 1981 to 1985, Negroponte presided over the second largest embassy in Latin America at the time and the largest CIA station in the world. From that post, Negroponte not only coordinated Washington's covert support for the Contra death squads and the Honduran junta, but he also covered up the crimes of its murderous Battalion 316. Negroponte's predecessor in Honduras, Ambassador Jack Binns, told the New York Times that Negroponte had discouraged reporting to Washington of abductions, torture, and killings by notorious Honduran military units, saying, quote, I think Negroponte was complicit in abuses. I think he tried to put the lid on reporting abuses, and I think he was untruthful to Congress about those activities. My first awareness uh, of the existence of the battalion by that name, and we can get into this because I'm not trying to uh, uh, be fancy with my use of words here now, but... Uh, John Negroponte was asked about the death squad in front of the Senate in 2001 during his confirmation hearing for U.N. ambassador. I asked uh, the CIA about Battalion 316th and was given uh, a memorandum uh, by the agency uh, at that time. Uh, to the best of uh, the agency's knowledge uh, at that time, uh, no, uh, there had been no substantiation of any human rights, uh, systemic human rights violations being carried out uh, by that unit. 
Among the crimes committed by U.S.-backed Honduran forces during Negroponte's tenure was the murder of a U.S. Jesuit priest named Father James Guadalupe Carney. Father Carney was a liberation theology revolutionary who spent 18 years with the Campesinos and living among the poor of Honduras. The U.S.-backed forces waged a smear campaign against Father Carney, who was a World War II veteran, claiming that he was a communist. When uh, a valley like this is, could produce enough food, they say, for all Central America, is, pro is producing uh, vegetable oil for Castle and Cook Company, I mean, that's a terrible crime. It's a sin. And that's why we Christians nowadays in Latin America, we, we want to change that. We, we rebel against that. Even if they call us communists, even if they kill us, we have to try to do something about it. In 1983, Father Carney was murdered by a U.S.-backed death squad. We still do not know the truth of what exactly happened to him, but there are many sources who say he was captured alive, tortured, and then thrown from a helicopter into the jungle. In a letter to The Economist in 1982, then Ambassador Negroponte wrote, and I quote, it is simply untrue that death squads have made appearances in Honduras. And yet from 1981 to 1984, over 150 people disappeared, including one American priest, Father James Carney, whose body has never been recovered. Father Carney's death is one of thousands that have gone unsolved in Honduras, and the overwhelming majority of those victims were Hondurans. Hundreds more were disappeared, never to be seen again, alive or dead. The country has never recovered from this dirty war and what the U.S. did in Honduras. Just as the worst of the bloodshed was letting up a decade later, U.S. neoliberal economic policy ravaged the country and made it one huge maquiladora for major corporations. The president of Honduras says he's the victim of a coup. He says he was brutally kidnapped by soldiers. His private secretary says Elia was taken into military custody at his house outside the capital. He was then whisked away to an Air Force base on the outskirts of the city. During the Obama administration, a military coup overthrew the democratically elected leftist government of Manuel Zelaya, and then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton supported the coup, even bragging that she had devised a way to resolve the crisis that would ensure that the elected president would never return to his post. Now, I didn't like the way it looked or the way they did it, but they had a very strong argument that they had followed the Constitution and the legal precedents. I bring this up because we need to understand that this situation was not created by Trump. It was created by more than a quarter of a century of U.S. policy. Trump is the thug who stepped in late in the game and has continued decades of brutal, murderous, inhumane U.S. policy and is now further punishing its victims. But how did you feel when you saw the images of the women and children running from the tear gas? Well, I do say, why are they there? I mean, I have to start off. First of all, the tear gas is a very minor form of the tear gas itself. Uh, it's very safe. Today, Honduras is governed by a U.S.-backed, undemocratic leader. Crime and corruption are rampant. Gangs run murderous operations, and poverty is widespread. Remember all of this history when you listen to Donald Trump's racist and xenophobic rhetoric. Remember that the U.S. played a central role over the course of decades in creating the conditions that have caused these desperate people, these families with their children, to flee. Remember this as you watch women and children gassed by U.S. forces. History matters. Context matters.